There's a remarkable story that we find in the Old Testament of uh, two great men who at, at the time of Moses, during the days in which uh, Moses had brought the people out of Egypt, they had all seen some great miracles. They had seen remarkable things happening. And then there's a decision. We're almost ready to enter this land that God has promised us. We're ready to enter into the land of Israel. And so they gathered together 12 remarkable leaders, 12 people who followed God. And they said, we want to send you into the promised land. Scout it out for us. Take a look around and come back with a report of what it's like. We know mostly about two of these so-called spies. Joshua and Caleb. A little later on in the story, we're going we're gonna to find out that Caleb was about 40 years old when he sent in to spy out the land. And we're told in the book of Joshua, as he, as he looks back and he reflects on this moment decades later, that the brothers... The righteous ones he was sent in to check out the land. Their hearts melted. His own testimony said, even though ten of them had their hearts melt when they look around and they see the struggle that they are to face, and they see the potential for things going wrong. He says, yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. You see, ten of them go in and they come back and say, we're like grasshoppers to the people that we're about to face. We're tiny, we have no hope. This is, this is an impossible task. We are facing opposition. We're facing struggle. We're facing more than we can handle. And ten of them, their hearts melt, and yet it says that two of them look to God. See, ten of them look to the struggle to see the king. To see the possibility that exists. In Joshua 14, Caleb, he's looking back, he says, I'm 85 years old now. In other words, 45 years have passed. And as he looks back, all he can do, even then, is not remember the giants. And not even the anxiety and fear that his fellow spies have. All he can see is at this stage, 45 years later, God delivered. And things got held up by fear and anxiety. But God delivered. God proved himself. And at 85, Caleb is making the, the case that, hey, because God is so great, my story's just started. All 12 who were sent in to check out this land, all 12 of them were considered leaders among the people of God. All had seen the miracles. All had participated in the Exodus. All had crossed through the Red Sea and seen God split it. All had seen the Ten Commandments come down from God. All were moral leaders among the people of God. They were the good ones. Two were focused on victory. Two were courageous. And two really believed and had real 
faith. Israel had been set apart to be a people who were to impact the world. But all too often through their history, fear was their king. Truly trusting in God inspires confidence, it inspires courage, it changes the path of where we're going. We're going to look at Psalm 125 today. This is uh, the section of Psalms that are, are called the Songs of Ascent. I, I've said a couple of times as we've started this series that as you go through them, they're kind of mostly divided into to groups of three. So the first group, we're now coming to the end of the second group of three. These have all been about where our focus is. Is it on the things that scare us, the things that might bring about anxiety? Or is our focus on the majesty of God? In Psalm 123, it, it starts off with these words, I lift my eyes to you, who is enthroned in the heavens. It's a, it's a song about looking up in anticipation to the one who calls us with mercy. It, it admits in this psalm that there are real problems, but I look to you. Despite everything going on, I look to you and I find mercy. The, the last one, Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on, had been on our side, and then the psalmist stops and he says, all together, everybody join with me in song. If it had not been the Lord who had been on our side. And he goes on to talk about that, all the disasters around it, they would have actually been real disasters. We need to turn our focus from our problems to the God who is active to see the victories in life, not the defeats. And 125, Psalm 125 kind of culminates this section. And it, it really is, how do we see God? Because if we see God as anxious, if we think that God is fearful of what's going on in life, if we see God as weak, our faith will be anxious and weak. But if our God is a mountain, do you know what? We're going to be strong as well. So we come to Psalm 125. In the first couple of verses there, we read this. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved but abides forever. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, so the Lord surrounds his people. For this time forth, and forevermore. Two different images of mountains in here. The first one is we will we are like Mount Zion. Now Mount Zion, now these people are on pilgrimage. They're traveling. They're going to the great festivals, the feasts of God. And as they're going, they're going to Mount Zion, the center of Jerusalem. And it compares us to a mountain. Now, Jesus later on talks about faith, and you've got just a little bit of faith. You can, you can move a mountain, and, and he uses that illustration because a mountain is generally not all that movable. I don't see the move very often. And he's, the psalmist here is saying, we are like this mountain. In the face of, of setbacks, in the face of enemies, we're like... Caleb and Joshua among those spies. We are the ones who abide forever. And then he brings up a second idea of mountains. There's a mountain range around Jerusalem. Now we'll be calling this a song of sense. Um, walking up hills, how I've entitled this sermon series because whatever direction you're coming from to Jerusalem, you're going to go uphill because there's mountains all around it. And the mountains... I said a few weeks ago, they were a bit of a pain. 
because they get in the way. They're not very nice to have to travel through. They, they don't provide very good agriculture. They, the mountains were generally looked at as poor land, but they did have one advantage, and that was they provide defense. They're hard to get. It makes it hard to get to Jerusalem. And, and the comparison the psalmist is making is saying, just like all these mountains, okay, they're not very good for agriculture, but they do provide good defense. And God, you are like this. Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in times of trouble. Therefore, because that's true, we don't fear. Even though the earth gives way, the, this psalm goes on to say that God is in our midst. Therefore, we cannot be moved. Psalm 139, you hem me in behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, and I cannot attain it. Really stop and think about what it means to have God in control. Meditate upon this, that God surrounds me. So often we spend our time focused on our anxieties, focused on what is wrong, in fact, we spend so much time there, you could say that we meditate on our anxieties, our fears, what is going wrong. And the call on us is to meditate on a God who surrounds us. John 17, just before Jesus arrived, he's praying. We call this the high priestly prayer, if you want that fancy title. He's he, it's not quite the same prayers in Gethsemane when he, he's sweating with drops of blood, but he's praying there specifically for his followers. And as Jesus is praying, he's praying for them because things are going to go wrong. And he's praying that they stay strong despite the fact that things are going to go wrong. I asked a question like this last week. If you missed last week's sermon or any of the sermons, you can you can now go online and uh, usually by Monday they're they're up there and uh, you can find the old sermons. Well, let me ask you a question like this. So I I, I say Jesus praying for us because things going are going to go wrong. What is the biggest thing you get out of that? That things are going to go wrong. Or that Jesus is praying for you. What matters more? That occasionally things might not go the way that we anticipate, or the fact that Jesus cares so much that he's actually taking time to go to the Heavenly Father for you. What matters more? What do we notice? Because that might just be an indication of how we see God and therefore our place in his kingdom. Do we have a God of the mountains who surrounds us and therefore makes us immovable? Or do I see my anxieties? Do I see them truly as a threat to myself? Do I see the things that scare me, the things that I fear, fear as a threat to God? In other words, is God anxious about the things that scare me? We might know one answer in our theology. The yeah, God's in the But really believe a different answer. Really how this plays out in my life is all I can see is the things that are out there that are threat. Israel 
You know what's remarkable? That going from crossing the Red Sea to then having their leaders shaking their boots because there's a threat against them. It's amazing how we can have moments of victory and then moments where we consumed with our fear. This is why God needs to keep being the center of our attention. We need to see him as victorious because that's our hope of being victorious. Next verse, verse 3, we read this. For the scepter of wickedness shall not rest on the land allotted to the righteous, lest the righteous stretch out their hand to do wrong. This is a very poetic little verse. And go figure, this is written to be poetry. And, and sometimes you can read poetry and some of the imagery again, and I kind of miss the full power here. One author said, maybe one way we can, we can phrase this is the hand of the wicked will not violate what God has claimed. Or perhaps this, evil will not find a home with you, but will remain for the, the, the idea is, I can't have wicked surroundings. Why? That, that word lest in the middle. It's going to give the reason why. Because the other alternative is the righteous will stretch out their hands to do wrong. Wickedness cannot reign, otherwise the righteous will do evil. I look at these 12 folks who go off to spy on the promised land. They head out, and they are then surrounded by evil. They're surrounded by what is this world. And, and this verse gets lived out. The ten of them focus on what the threat is. And, they, and what happens when they focus on what the threat is? Do you want they go back to all the rest of the people? And they start telling them, here's the problems, here's the struggle, here's what's going wrong, and do you know what happens to the rest of the people who didn't go in and see all the fears? Fear is contagious. The anxieties build up among all the people and, and everyone starts to become fearful. We can't go in and do what God has asked us to do. This isn't going to work. God's way is not going to succeed. we got to stay here. we got to hide in the desert. We're better off staying where we're not making purpose. Two of them are a little bit different. Because what they see is not the scepter of wickedness all around them. They meditate on God. Oh, we're kind of surrounded by a lot of things that can take our attention. We're called on throughout scriptures to meditate on God. And I gotta be honest with you, sometimes somebody comes and says something kind of hurtful, negative, vicious. I'll be honest with you, there are times where that becomes what I meditate on. That person's comments. Or sometimes somebody rubs me the wrong way and, and that's what I meditate on. Or I spend time on social media or, or, or watch the news or something like that. Or watch entertainment and those become the things that I meditate on. That's a scepter of wickedness 
that rests on the land allotted to the righteous. There's so many places I can meditate on other than God. The ten that are, are set in the land and end up falling can see nothing but what is scary and wrong, and so they falter and they discourage everyone else. Two can only see victory. Two can only see the God of victory. And they focus there. <clears throat> and so even when the other ten fail and, and they drag everyone else down, they're stuck waiting another 45 years to see their victory. But it doesn't matter. Because what matters is the victory of God. It doesn't even matter the delay that occurs. What matters is they see God at work. They can be patient because they see the God that surrounds them, the mountains that surround Jerusalem. So they're not discouraged, but they are victorious. The short little psalm ends with verses 4 and 5 that read, Do good, O Lord, to those who are good, and to those who are upright in their hearts. But to those who turn aside to their crooked ways, the Lord will lead them, lead away with evil doers. Peace be upon Israel. First little bit here, those who are upright, those who are courageous. When we read through the Bible, courage is one of those things we're commanded to be. We're commanded to have courage. It's not found in like the fruit of the spirit or things like that, but it is found quite often. Psalm 27, wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Second part of this uh, set of verses talks about those who turn aside. Those who, who turn aside are those who start down the right path, but they've been distracted. You, you take the language here, it's very much related to what's gone on before. It's, it's those who let their eyes turn aside from the things of God. It's those who lack courage. It's, it's like those ten who went into the land of Israel and all they could see was their fears. We've got two different sets of people and two different sets of ways things can go. People who lack courage because they haven't found strength in the God who is a mountain range protecting us. So they discard, they toss aside what is right for what will alleviate their fears. And sometimes acting like the world makes us feel strong. If I imitate the way the world acts, if they're acting bad, I match it. Maybe I strike first with people because I fear what will happen if I don't. And yet the call on us is to remain faithful. Matthew chapter 24 is, a, is an intriguing little uh, chapter. Jesus is uh, with his disciples not long before he's arrested. They're walking through the city of Jerusalem. They're going through the temple courtyard. And the disciples are all looking up at the temple. And they're focused on it. The temple's probably the biggest building that at this stage in their lives any of them had ever seen. It's probably the most spectacular building they'd ever seen. And they're looking at it, and they're admiring it. The temple was being rebuilt at this stage of time. It was, it was getting close to completion. And they're looking at it, marveling at the additions that have been done since the last time they looked. And Jesus says to them, don't get too excited. Very quickly, now one brick is going to stay on top of another. 
And they get to a private place a little later and they start to ask questions. Now indeed, within just a couple of years, the Romans are going to come along, they're going to destroy the temple. And that's exactly what's going to happen, probably around the time that the book of Matthew is being written. And, and Jesus goes into kind of prophetic mode with the disciples, and he starts to tell them about this time, but it echoes forward, and certainly echoes towards the time just before Christ's return, but also other times in which there are things going on. And Jesus starts to warn them about not falling away. Do not lead, do not let anyone lead you astray. That means it's possible. And he looks at them and says, you're, you're going to hear lots and lots of bad news. Wars, rumors, wars, and it goes on like this. You're going to hear lots of bad news. Don't panic. It's not yet the end. This is the, the, the echoes before that. You're going to hear and start to see things really going on. Times of arrest, persecution. And he even throws in love growing cold. You do. The whole chapter is about endure because. And he has a point. Endure because. This will allow the gospel to move forward. This will set you apart. Living in true faith of God when everything's going wrong sets us apart from a world that is consumed with fear. He will then go on to describe even greater disasters that are all where Christ returns to this planet. But what goes on before this is, is, is quite fascinating. The bad news starts. They, 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 they hear things that scare them. Things will go actually wrong. But it's going to prove your faith to a world that otherwise would not be able to believe. When you focus on faith and courage, it changes things. I'm part of the early church, the Celtic church. I think it was uh, when the Irish and, and, and that area was coming to believe in Jesus back in the 4th century, 5th century AD. There was a lot of struggle. It was a hard thing to do, to come to Christ. And uh, I've told this story before, you know, Patrick, St. Patrick, he was, he was kind of the famous one who led this. He started off as a slave, escaped, returned, knowing that he might end up back in slavery. He was one of a, a series of missionaries that came in and did some remarkable things among a faithless generation. And, and they wrote about having a thin faith. And by thin faith, what they meant is in times where there was struggle going on, in times where there was hard times happening, faith got thin. And they meant by that that there was, a, it was almost like there was just a thin layer in hard times between heaven and earth. That it seemed in harder times you could prove God more. And so therefore heaven felt close. So he said, the 
harder things were, the more important it was to meditate on God. You know, courageous faith makes God more accessible. So do good, because God will do good. The call here is do not give in to fear, which leads you away, which leads you to imitate this world. We certainly live in a day in which polarization is so real. And the call of Christ is not to live like this polarized world, but to live in awe of God. Not to be focused on this world at all. It's not our home. But boy, we have a Savior. What a remarkable Savior. We don't let the world dictate our lives. Instead, we're to be people fixated on hope, overwhelmed by goodness. This passage, Psalm 125, ends with a, a remarkable little benediction, peace be upon Israel. This calls shalom. He's, he's writing about, okay, some people are distracted, some people are pulled away by, by, by what they see all the time. I read one author who said, you can almost translate this, relax. Relax. Yeah, there's a lot of struggle out there. So people of God, real people of God, relax. For as the mountains surround Jerusalem and make you the center mountain, so the Lord surrounds his people from this time forth and forevermore. Next week, conclusion, we're going to move on to Psalm 126, which is is all about some of the results of focusing on God that uh, we, we sow in tears, but we reap in shouts of joy. The joy is going to be a result of this. It seems quite worthwhile. That's our goal. And we need to spend some time focused on God. And if you need to spend some time in prayer, please do so. We're going to have this plan to protect uh, training in just a few moments. In your bulletins, it says it's going to be a grief time. Actually, should we breathe? There's not going to be much grief involved. Um, if you want to be involved in, in any of our kids' ministries, like Vacation Bible School or anything like that, and you didn't do the training in the fall, I encourage you to come. Just stick around at the end, and we're just going to spend 15 minutes doing that. But in the meantime, before we get there, Focus on God. Spend some time really looking at Him. There's so many distractions in this world. I mean, instead of spending so much time staring at the distraction, we need to spend more time in prayer. There's so many things that are positive. We're going to sing in just a moment. Music is certainly one of them. There's other things that draw our souls higher and closer to God. We don't need to spend more time doing that. To letting Jesus pull us up rather than be pulling, pulled down to the level of this world. To, to, to make ourselves the most hopeful of all people. To let our souls soar so we can grow. So let's take a few moments. Let's just focus our hearts once again on worship.